Good morning. Welcome to the Car Rigs and Ingram 2022 year end tax planning for individuals and their families. Um, this morning, we're going to discuss um, some tax law changes as well as some uh, tried and true uh, tax planning ideas that you may want to consider and think about as 2022 winds down. Um, before we get started, have a few housekeeping items we're going to cover. Um, first, if anyone is uh, needing a CPE cert certification or a continuing professional education credit, um, this webinar does qualify for one credit hour of CPE. Um, in order to get that CPE, you need to log in to your own uh, registration link through Zoom and stay logged in through that uh, same device through the entire webinar. You have to be in attendance at least 50 minutes and answer at least 80% of the polling questions to receive that one credit hour. Um, if you meet those requirements, um, CPE certificates will be um, sent via email from our outside vendor um, probably about seven days after the event. So uh, watch that inbox um, if you're looking for a CPE certificate. If you have any other questions about the CPE certification process, feel free to meet, uh, email our marketing team at marketing at CRICPA.com. Um, for those that would like to have a copy of the presentation slides, um, if you go to the Zoom uh, chat function, you should be able to see a link where you can download a copy of the presentation. Um, you can uh, have that and go along um, on your own, as well as have a uh, go ahead, or have a uh, copy of the slides that you can refer back to um, after the presentation. Also want to point out that um, the question and answer uh, function of Zoom is it's how you can ask questions uh, to the presenters during the course of the, the webinar. Um, we'll try and uh, ta tackle as many of those uh, polling questions, or sorry, as many of those questions that come in um, during the polling questions. And then if there is any time permitting, we will tackle the rest at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce the presenters for today's webinar. First is Richard Lenois. He is a partner in the Atlanta office. Um, he got his master's degree from Kennesaw State University and enjoys walking his hometown Atlanta Braves. Um, he also enjoys spending family time adventuring with his two daughters. And he has two beagles that also keep him busy. Also presenting is Patty McGill. She is a partner in our Mobile, Alabama office. She got her bachelor's degree from Spring Hill College, where she actually uh, also played uh, soccer in college. Um, she's now hung up her cleats and is a full-time cheerleader for her two kids and also enjoys her Aussie doodle named Bo. And myself, I am Chris Hoffman. I sit in the Nashville, Tennessee office. I am both a partner and the tax service line leader of Car Riggs and Ingram. I received my master's degree from the University of Tennessee. And in addition to uh, watching the Vols, I also like to watch the Titans and the Predators. Um, in, in fact, as we, uh, my family and I take a trip to Hilton Head every year, and we have had Boston Terriers for as long as I can remember. Now I'm going to go through the agenda for today's uh, webinar before handing it off to the presenters. Um, we're going to start out by covering 2022 updates to brackets and deductions, um, different numbers and things you need to keep in mind. Um, and then we'll transition into special considerations. Uh, this will be things like uh, some of the COVID um, tax items and other sunsetting provisions that you may want to take, in, uh, take into account as, as the year winds down. We'll then cover capital gains and losses. Uh, the, the market has been uh, has had its ups and lots of downs this year, so um, definitely want to uh, cover um, things you need to think about um, in, in terms of capital gains and losses for the year. We'll then cover retirement accounts and different planning ideas that you can use um, to maximize retirement. Um, and then uh, go into education expenses uh, for those you know, who have um, college age kids or kids going uh, getting close to college age, um, different ideas that you can think about to help fund those education expenses. 
We'll then wrap up with gift tax considerations. Um, gifting is, has been a hot topic over the years as, as the gift exclusion has been increasing. So we will um, cover some of those topics um, that you, you need to be thinking about um, as, as your uh, gifting um, towards year end uh, comes into play. With that, I will hand it off to Richard, who will get us started with the 2022 tax updates. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to everyone taking time out of your day to join this webinar. We have a lot of material to cover uh, in, in a short hour, so I'll jump right in. The US uses a marginal tax system, which means you are taxed on your income in stages or brackets. There's a common misconception that all of your income is taxed in the highest bracket you fall in. That's simply just not true. To find your set of brackets, you, you first need to determine your filing status. Are you filing as a single unmarried taxpayer, married filing joint, married filing separate, or head of household? The brackets for each can be found on this slide and on the next slide. For married taxpayers, in most cases, filing joint is more beneficial than filing separately. Running both scenarios is really the only way to know which provides the greatest benefit or the least amount of tax. These brackets are adjusted annually for inflation. The 2022 brackets represent an increase of three to three and a quarter percent from the prior year. And like I said before, they're adjusted annually for inflation. So it's no surprise the 2023 brackets, which were released a couple of weeks ago, are roughly 7% higher than the 2022 brackets with the top tax rate remaining at 37%. And now we're gonna go into some deductions uh, which help reduce taxable income. <clears throat> Each taxpayer is eligible for a standard deduction uh, that varies based on filing status. You have the option of taking the standard deduction or an itemized deduction. And in most instances, you only take the itemized deduction if it exceeds the standard deduction that you are eligible for. Itemized deductions include expenses such as unreimbursed medical and dental, state and local income, general sales, real estate and personal property taxes, home mortgage interest, investment interest, and charitable donations, each of which have limitations that we will discuss later. The married filing joint standard deduction for 2022 is $25,900. That amount is cut in half if filing as single or married filing separate. Um, a head of household filer is eligible for a $19,400 standard deduction. Um, to file as head of household, you must be considered unmarried on the last day of the year and have quali a qualifying child or dependent. The base standard deduction for tax year 2022 increased $800 for married filing joint filers, $400 for single and married filing separate, and $600 for head of household from the prior year amounts. Due to inflation, these are set to increase significantly for the tax year 2023. Married filing joint will increase $1,800. Single and married filing separate filers will increase $900, and head of household will increase $1,400. The additional deduction for the elderly and or blind is increasing $100 for each filing status. The standard deductions allowed are increased by each elderly and or blind taxpayer. For example, the standard deduction in 2022 for a married filing joint couple in which both are elderly and only one is blind is eligible for a $30,100 standard deduction. In this scenario, you take the base standard deduction of $25,900 and add $1,400 three times, once for each elderly and once for the blind. Now let's take a look at some uh, other deductions that are not included as part of itemized deductions. Um, the, the Healthcare Flex Spending Account, or FSA, is a special account you put pre-tax dollars into that can be used for certain out-of-pocket healthcare costs. These are typically a use it or lose it account, meaning you must use the money in the FSA within the plan year. Some accounts may provide a grace period of up to two and a half extra months to use the money or the ability to carry over up to $570 per year. 
which is 20% of the maximum annual contribution amount for 2022. Um, that carryover can be increased um, as the maximum annual contribution is increased. For tax year 2022, the contribution limit per person is $2,850 and is increased to $3,050 for tax year 2023. A health savings account is a type of account that lets you set aside money on a pre-tax basis to pay for qualified medical expenses. You are only eligible to make contributions to an HSA if you have a high deductible health plan. These are not a use it or lose it type of account and the funds do not need to be held in cash. The funds can be invested and grow tax-free as long as the withdrawals are used for qualified medical expenses. The tax year 2022 contribution limit for an HSA is $3,650 for a self-only plan or double that $7,300 for a family plan. If you are age 55 or older, an additional $1,000 catch-up contribution can be made for either self-only or family plans. Let's take a look at some of the itemized deductions. We'll start with medical expenses. <clears throat> for medical expenses to be included in itemized deductions, the out-of-pocket costs must exceed 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, and only the excess amount is included as a deduction. For example, if your AGI, or adjusted gross income, is $100,000, only the out-of-pocket pocket medical costs exceeding $7,500 can be included with your itemized deductions. For tax year 2022, the medical mileage deduction has two rates depending on the date for medical travel. Medical mileage from January 1st to June 30th is at a rate of 18 cents per mile and mileage from July 1st through December 31st is at a rate of 22 cents per mile. Sufficient records should be kept to support any medical mileage deduction claim. You may be able to claim a higher medical expense deduction in years with lower income. If you're able to plan out certain medical procedures in years with lower income, you will get a greater benefit to the medical expense deduction because the 7.5% floor will be lower. And with that, that takes us to our first polling question. Okay, thanks, Richard. First polling question, what amount of out-of-pocket medical expenses are tax deductible for taxpayers who claim itemized deductions? Is it all of them? Is it up to 7.5% of AGI? Is it the amount exceeding 7.5% of AGI? Or all, are none of those medical expenses deductible? Uh, while I give folks uh, time to respond to that polling question, we did have a question come in, Richard. Um, you mentioned that the um, elderly could receive the extra um, standard deduction. Uh, what age uh, do you have to be uh, to qualify as elderly for, for this purpose? 65 or older, Chris. Yep. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. With that, let's go ahead and um, look at those poll results, and we will see what the audience says here. Yeah, 88% of the audience saying it's the amount exceeding 7.5% of AGI. I think that's the uh, answer we were looking for, Richard. That's correct. Okay, perfect. And I will hand it back off to you to cover more about itemized deductions. All right, as a refresher, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was signed into law December of 2017, restricted many itemized deductions through tax year 2025. That includes the combined $10,000 limitation on state and local income taxes, property taxes, and general sales tax. The deductible amount of home mortgage interest is limited to the amount related to a principal balance of $750,000 or less for debt incurred after December 15, 2017. A pro rata amount of mortgage interest paid on the year is deductible if the principal balance of the debt is greater than the limitation. Interest paid on a home equity line is only deductible if the debt was used to buy, build, or substantially improve the home that secures the loan. 
Also included in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, is the elimination of miscellaneous deductions, such as tax prep fees, brokerage fees or investment expenses, unreimbursed employee business expenses, and estate planning. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about charitable do uh, contributions. Uh, the limitation for cash charitable donations to public, public charities is back at 60% of your adjusted gross income. This was limited to 100% of your AGI in 2021. Non-cash donations such as cars, art, or items you would donate to Goodwill, clothing, household items, furniture, etc., are still limited to 50% of your AGI. Capital gain property, such as appreciated stock, is still limited to 30%. Donations to a donor advised fund or private foundation are deducted in the year in which the donation is made to the fund. You do not receive an additional charitable donation when the monies are ultimately dispersed to a qualifying organization. Charitable donations that exceed the limitations are carried forward for up to five years. Some planning items for maximizing your charitable donations include alternating donation years. Um, keep in mind, your benefit for taking itemized deductions is only the amount that exceeds uh, the standard deduction that you're eligible for. Um, alternate, alternating donation years may allow you to alternate taking the itemized deduction and the standard deduction from year to year in order to maximize your charitable donation benefit. Donor advised funds are great if you have a high income year in which you know you want to be charitable, but haven't yet identified the charitable organizations you'd like to give to. You will receive the deduction in the year you make the donation to the donor advised fund and you have additional time to disperse the funds to charities of your choosing. Qualified charitable donations from an IRA are a great way to reduce your taxable income while satisfying the required minimum distribution requirement. You are limited to $100,000 per tax year and you must be at least 70 and a half years of age. Um, you can also donate appreciated stock uh, when, you, when you donate appreciated stock, you do not recognize the appreciation as taxable income, uh, and you get the charitable deduction equal to the fair market value of the appreciated stock. Donating appreciated stock to a donor advised fund instead of donating cash is a tax planning technique that is often used. All right, that takes us to polling question number two, Chris. Okay, thanks, Richard. Next polling question, which of the following is a way to maximize your charitable deductions? Is it alternating year-end donations? Is it uh, using a donor advised fund? Is it uh, using a qualified charitable donation from an IRA? Is it contributing appreciated stock <clears throat> or is it all of the above? Um, with that, uh, there have been some questions coming in um, specifically on that HELOC interest that you mentioned. Um, do you know when you mentioned this, there has to be significant improvements or the money has to be used for significant improvements? Um, do you have some examples of what those uh, improvements may be? Uh, they could be additions to the home, they could be renovations to the home, um, you know, substantial renovations if you're completely you're doing the bathroom, if you're redoing your floors. Um, they have to be significant. They can't be more or less a repair, a small repair to the home. Right. Thanks for clarifying that. I think the, the main takeaway there is that it has to be used on the home. Um, you, you can't use a, a HELOC loan and use the funds to pay for a vacation or pay for a student's college. Um, it, you know, the, it has to be used within the home. So thanks for clarifying. That's correct. In order for that interest to be deducted as a mortgage interest on the itemized deductions. Yep. Let's look at the poll results. Like 91% say all the above. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's what we're looking for there, Richard. Yep, that is correct. Okay. And with that, I will hand it off to Patty, who will uh, discuss some of the special considerations to be thinking about. 
Uh, thanks, Chris, and good morning, everybody. Um, next on our agenda, we're going to discuss some special considerations for uh, 2022. Um, there are a couple COVID related provisions that have changed for 22, as well as two business related considerations we thought would be of importance to note. Uh, with that said, let's jump into the first one, and it's the um, child tax credit. As many of you are aware, uh, major changes were made to the child tax credit for 2021, but they were unfortunately only temporary. Um, the credit amount was increased. The credit was made fully refundable. Children up to 17 years of age qualified, and half the credit amount was paid um, in advance payments through um, the months July through December of last year. For uh, the 22 tax year, the child tax credit reverts back to its pre-21 form. That means the 22 credit amount drops uh, back down to 2,000 per child. Children who are 17 years old do not qualify for the credit this year. Uh, the age limit drops back down to the former age limit of 16 years old. For some lower income taxpayers, the um, 22 credit is only partially refundable. Um, up to a $1,500 per qualifying child, and they must have earned income of at least $2,500 to take advantage of the credit's limited uh, refundability. For tax year uh, 22, the child tax credit starts phasing out for families with modified adjusted gross income above $200,000 for single filers and $400,000 for joint filers. Moving on to the second COVID-related provision, um, we have the Child Independent uh, Tax Care Credit. Significant improvements were also made to this um, credit for 21, but again, the change is only applied for the one year. Um, the 21 credit was worth 20% 20, uh, 20 to 50%, up to 8,000 in eligible expenses for one qualifying child or 16,000 for two or more. The percentage decreased as um, the taxpayer's AGI exceeded $125,000. And the maximum credit for 21 was uh, $4,000 if you had one qualifying, one qualifying child or $8,000 if you had more than one. Uh, the credit was also fully refundable in 21. For 22, uh, the child independent care credit is now non-refundable and the maximum credit percent drops from 50% to 35%. The credit is only allowed for up to 3,000 in expenses for one child and uh, 6,000 for more than one child. When the 35% max credit percent is applied, that puts the top, um, top credit for 22 tax year at $1,050 if you have one child um, and $2,100 if you have two or more children. In addition, the full uh, child independent care credit will only be allowed for families making less than $15,000 a year in 22. And after that, the credit starts to phase out. Families with annual income between um, 45,000 and 480,000 can claim 20% um, of their care expenses, uh, up to 600 in credits for one child or 1,200 if you have uh, more than two children. The next uh, special consideration is that of bonus depreciation. Um, as many of you know, uh, the 17 uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act permitted 100% bonus depreciation uh, for assets with useful lives of 20 years or less. Uh, the bonus depreciation, however, was enacted on a temporary basis and is scheduled to drop by 20 percentage points per year beginning in 2023 um, until it fully phases out after the end of 26. The last special consideration um, we're going to discuss is that of the excess business losses limitation. Unfortunately, uh, with the constant change in our tax law over the last few years, um, it continues to make tax planning a challenging endeavor. Uh, one such change involves this excess business losses limitation. The uh, limitation applies to non-corporate taxpayers, such as individuals um, and trust in estates, and does not allow a business loss uh, to exceed 270,000 for single filers or 540,000 for married file and joint filers for the tax year uh, 22. This limitation um, is calculated after other limitations for at-risk loss and passive activity losses. Um, these limitations are obviously very complex and must be analyzed at several levels. 
The first um, is the amount of any loss is limited to the taxpayer's basis, which is generally the cost amount that a taxpayer invests in a business asset. The basis may also be increased by a taxpayer's share of um, their debt. Next, um, a taxpayer must consider the amount of losses for which the taxpayer is at risk. This generally considers only the share of debt uh, finance losses for which a taxpayer is personally, personally liable um, for payment, repayment, sorry. Then a taxpayer must consider um, the passive loss limitations, which limits a taxpayer's deduction for losses to only those activities in which a taxpayer mater materially participates. Uh, finally, after all of those are taken into consideration, um, the excess business loss limitation is considered. Um, any losses disallowed in the current year are carried forward as a net operating loss uh, to the following year. And with that, we have our next polling question. Okay, thanks, Patty. Next polling question. <clears throat> what is the max child tax credit available for each qualified child in tax year 2022? Is it 2,000? Is it 3,000? Is it 3,600 or is it 4,000? Well, I give folks a few minutes or a few moments to respond to that polling question. We did have a question come in on Patty on the child tax credit. Um, you mentioned that the age is going down to 16. Um, does the child have to be 16 at the beginning of the year or the end of the year? Uh, can you um, kind of clarify uh, what point in time the child has to be 16 in order to qualify? Chris, that's a good question. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I believe they have to be at the by the end of the year is the is the mark. Um, so yeah, I think you have to look at the age of the child at the end of the year um, to, to see if they see if they qualify. So if you have a a child who's 16 at the beginning of the year but turns 17 during the year, um, unfortunately, I, I don't think they they qualify because they'll they'll be 17 at the end of the year. But that's a great question, and, and thanks for submitting that. Let's look at those poll results now. 65% uh, say 2,000, 26% say 3,000. Uh, can you clarify that for folks, Patty? Um, the maximum credit in 22 is 2,000, so A is correct. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And with that, I will hand it back to Richard to cover capital gains and losses. Thank you, Chris. Most people are aware that long-term capital gains have a preferential tax rate. Many may know that rate to be 20%. However, long-term capital gain tax rates can be as low as 0% zero to, zero depending on the filing status and adjusted gross income of the taxpayer. Additionally, a 3.8% net investment income tax applies to net investment income to the extent that modified adjusted gross income exceeds $200,000 for single and head of household filers, $250,000 for married filing joint and $125,000 for married filing separate. <clears throat> Future rate changes are unclear, but always a possibility. As you may recall, this was a hot topic in the original proposal of the Build Back Better Act. With the wild markets we have had in 2022, you may have had a capital gain from something sold early in the year uh, so you might consider selling certain loss positions before the end of the year to offset those gains and, and vice versa. If you have recognized overall capital losses for the year, you may consider selling an appreciated asset to offset those losses. Can we move forward one slide? Thank you. All right. Um, also, if, if there are significant gains, consider reinvesting some or all of these gains in a qualified opportunity zone fund. Um, it's a way to defer or potentially even eliminate some of the, the tax on the gain. Um, another option is uh, to have 
tax on capital gain, you know, tax your capital gains at the marginal rates uh, to maximize the investment interest deduction if it's otherwise being limited. Uh, the overall net capital loss um, you're, you're eligible to, to use to offset ordinary income each year is $3,000 um, or $1,500 if you're married filing separately. Uh, there's, there's also a, a pretty generous exclusion uh, when you sell your principal residence. Uh, you can exclude up to $250,000 of gain, $500,000 per married couple is filing jointly uh, if you meet certain tests. Um, moving on to 1031 like kind exchanges. Most times 1031 exchanges are utilized in business entities, but can be utilized by individuals who own real estate held for investment or used in an income producing activity. This is a strategic way to defer capital gains tax in the year of a sale and really kick that tax can down the road. Essentially, you use the proceeds from a property you sold which is known as the relinquished property to acquire a like property known as the replacement property. The point is that the business activity continues on, but with the property in a different physical location. There are many rules to consider and follow uh, for a 1031 exchange, such as the 45 day rule. You have 45 days from the date you sold the relinquished property to properly identify the replacement property. There's a 180 day rule, which runs concurrent with the 45 day rule. Uh, you have 180 days from the date you sold the relinquished property to close on uh, the replacement property. Also use of a qualified intermediary is basically a must in this type of transaction. Uh, you're not allowed to have access or free reign to the proceeds from the sale of property. Um, if, you, if you touch or have access to those proceeds, the transaction will be taxable and the tax-free exchange will fail. Uh, you should consider all tax law changes uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, both federal and state level, when planning to sell uh, any, any type of investment in real property. That takes us to polling question number four. Okay, thanks, Richard. Next polling question. Over the last couple of years, owners have seen a significant increase in the value of their homes. <clears throat> Upon sale of a primary residence, what is the potential gain exclusion for a married couple filing a joint return? Is it 25,000? Is it 50,000? Is it 250,000? Or is it 500,000? Give everyone a, a few moments to respond. And in the meantime, I had a question come in, Richard, on like kind exchanges. Um, question came in, if someone has an aircraft, an, an airplane um, that they're looking to sell um, and invest in real estate, can they uh, use the 1031 like kind exchange to sell their airplane and invest in real estate? Uh, that would be a no. Um... It has to be real property for real property. And uh, a plane uh, is not considered real property. Um, so no, in, in that instance, a 1031 exchange would not work. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Let's uh, see those poll results. 80% um, say 500,000, 15% um, say 250,000. Uh, can you clarify that for folks, Richard? For a, a married couple filing a joint return, the, um, the gain exclusion for a sale of a primary residence is up to $500,000. Um, and, and this could come into play, um, especially given the real estate market in the last couple of years. Uh, one of the, the major tests that have to be met is that the, the primary, it was your primary residence um, for, for two of the last five years, uh, if it's less than two years, uh, if you held the primary residence for less than two years, there are some um, ways you can get a, a portion of the exclusion, uh, but you have to look at the certain test that, that you'd qualify for. Thanks for clarifying that. It's great information, Richard. 
Um, let's um, go ahead and hand it back off to Patty, who will cover retirement planning and retirement accounts. Thanks, Chris. Um, so our next topic to discuss is that of retirement accounts. Um, we're going to discuss potential ways we can look to maximize our contributions to fund our retirements, as well as ways to minimize our tax liability. Uh, first, let's discuss contributing to your retirement and the benefits. Um, first and foremost, uh, pre-tax contributions give you an immediate benefit by making contributions on a pre-tax basis, which then reduces your annual taxable income and therefore your tax liability. Um, second, all earnings inside your retirement account grow tax-free until you take withdrawals in the future. In certain instances, taxpayers are able to withdraw funds from their retirement plans um, without penalty. For example, um, for higher education expenses for you, your spouse, or your child. Um, also to purchase a home as a first time home buyer or to help out a child, grandchild, or even a parent um, provided that they meet the first time home buyer definition. Um, in addition, if there's a birth or adoption expenses, um, and those are just to name a few. And lastly, uh, like with all things, timing is key. Um, not everyone is in the same place when planning for retirement. Therefore, uh, different plan options available adds flexibility for taxpayers. With that said, um, let's look at the contribution limits for um, 22 for some of the different plans. Um, the maximum contribution limits for 401k, 403b, or 457 um, jumps to 20,500 for um, tax year 22, while the taxpayers um, 50 and older can once again put in um, 6,500 more as a catch-up contribution. The annual defined contribution plans um, contribution limits are 61,000 for 22, um, with annual compensation limits of uh, 305,000 in 22. You also see um, that we put 23 in there also just for future planning. Um, the 22, Contribution limit for a traditional IRA and uh, Roth IRAs stayed steady at 6,000 plus the 1,000 as additional catch up um, for individuals 50 and up. The income ceilings on Roth IRA contributions uh, went up to 20, went up for 22 with contributions phasing out at AGIs of 204,000 to 214,000 for couples and 129,000 to 144,000 for single filers. Uh, deduction phase outs for the traditional IRA also started at higher rates in 22 um, from AGIs of 109,000 to 129,000 for uh, couples and 68,000 to 78,000 for uh, single filers. <clears throat> Next, um, in some in situations, some taxpayers may be able um, to take a tax credit for making eligible contributions to their IRA or employer-sponsored uh, retirement plan. Depending on their AGI, um, the amount of the credit available is 50%, 20%, or 10%. The maximum contribution amount that may qualify for the credit is $2,000 for single filers or $4,000 for married file and joint, uh, making the credit 1,000 for single filers and 2,000 for married filing jointly. Um, this next slide shows different strategies that can be incorporated um, into your retirement planning when using IRAs. Uh, the first one shows uh, the, spousal, the spousal IRA. Um, this IRA allows a working partner to open an IRA for a non-working spouse uh, to save for retirement. This option can be especially beneficial in times of economic turmoil uh, where one spouse may be out of work or has limited uh, earnings. The next option is the backdoor Roth IRA. Uh, this is a strategy rather than an official type of uh, IRA account. Um, is a technique used by high income earners that lets them convert uh, non-deductible traditional IRA contributions to a Roth IRA even if uh, income is too high to make a Roth IRA contribution. This technique is not a tax dodge uh, since you will still owe taxes on any funds that have not been taxed previously. 
The backdoor Roth IRA is just a legal way um, to get around the income limits that usually prevent high earners from owning Roth IRAs. The third strategy is a Roth conversion. Roth conversions are a way to move or reposition your assets from a traditional SEP uh, or simple IRA or for, from a 401k into a Roth IRA. Uh, the be benefits of doing this conversion are uh, hopes of having a lower tax burden in retirement and also um, for reduced RMD requirements. Unfortunately, at the time of the conversion, you will have to pay tax um, on the converted amount, but once you pay taxes on the conversion, the money will grow tax-free um, in the Roth IRA until it's withdrawn in the future. Uh, one thing to think about when you're converting your entire traditional IRA balance, uh, this can bump you up into a higher tax bracket. Um, but if this happens, you can spread conversions um, over several years. There are a few other concepts to keep in mind with Roth conversions. Um, if you're thinking about doing one of these, please reach out to your trusted CRI um, advisor to see if they can offer you uh, more guidance on your personal tax situation. And the last um, IRA strategy is contributing to an IRA for a dependent child. Um, this is an IRA that a custodian, typically a parent, holds for a minor um, that has earned income. The IRA contributions cannot exceed the minor's um, earnings. Therefore, for example, if a child earns $1,000 in a year, um, then only 1,000 can be contributed to the account. Uh, with the annual maximum contribution for 22 being $6,000. Um, there were a couple retirement distribution changes made in the last couple of years um, that we felt needed to be pointed out again for 22. Um, the first being that the new age for uh, the required minimum distributions increased um, to 72 instead of the previous age of 70 and a half. Um, secondly, in previous years, if you inherited an IRA or a 401k, you could um, potentially stretch your distributions um, and tax payments over your single life expectancy. Um, unfortunately, the SECURE Act um, eliminated the so-called stretch provision for most um, non-spousal beneficiaries. The IRS uh, generally requires the non-spouse inherited IRA owners to start uh, taking the RMDs no later than December 31st um, in the year following the death of the original account owner. Uh, with the passage of the SECURE Act, most non-spousal beneficiaries are required to distribute the fuel balance of their account within 10 years, um, provided they inherited the account from an owner who was already taken RMDs. And lastly, um, the SECURE Act also allowed parents to uh, withdraw up to 5,000 out of their IRAs or 401k plans following the birth or adoption of a child um, without having to pay the 10% early withdrawal penalty. Importantly, uh, the withdrawal must be taken after the child is born or adopted. Um, parents have up to one year following the date of birth or adoption to process the distribution from their retirement account to avoid the 10% penalty. The 5,000 limit is available for each parent, um, meaning that each parent um, can take a distribution out of their retirement plan for a combined distribution of $10,000. Um, the 10% Penalty exemption is available for each child that is born and there's uh, no lifetime limit. All right, we're moving on to our next slide. We're going to discuss different tax planning options when dealing um, with retirement distributions. Um, the first one um, is RMDs. As we have pre previously discussed in our webinar, um, RMDs are your required minimum distributions that you must withdraw um, from your traditional IRA or employer-sponsored uh, retirement account each year um, after you turn 72, as mandated by the IRS. The IRS taxes these RMDs as ordinary income, which means they will be taxed at your um, applicable income tax rate. One tax saving strategy um, that can be used when planning with an RMD is a qualified charitable distribution or a QCD. Um, the QCD is a direct transfer of funds from your IRA uh, custodian payable to a qualified charity. Uh, QCDs can be counted towards satisfying your RMD for the year um, as long as certain rules are met. In addition um, to the benefits of giving to charity, uh, QCD excludes the amount donated from taxable income 
which is unlike you know regular withdrawals from an IRA. Uh, keeping your taxable income lower may help reduce um, impact to certain tax credits and deductions. <clears throat> Lastly, the QCDs don't require that you itemize, which uh, due to the recent tax law changes means you may decide to take advantage um, of a higher standard deduction, but still use a QCD for charitable giving. Um, like Richard stated earlier, the maximum annual amount that um, can qualify for a QCD is 100,000. Uh, the next distribution to discuss is the repayment of COVID distributions. Um, during 2020, the CARES Act allowed taxpayers to withdraw a maximum of 100000 across eligible um, retirement plans. The COVID distributions were exempt from the 10% 10, um, 10 early withdrawal penalty, as well as the income tax liability um, could be spread over three years. The CARES Act allow, um, also allowed the ability to repay the amount withdrawn back to a plan over the next three years, in which case the distribution would not be considered taxable. Um, if you as a taxpayer took CARES Act distributions, um, you still have time to make repayments back to your retirement plan through 2023. Excuse me. The third topic of discussion um, is that of beneficiary designations on the inherited IRAs. As we discussed on the previous slide, um, the SECURE Act did away with the non spousal beneficiaries lifetime stretch provision um, and replaced it with the 10-year distribution cap. Uh, one of the exemptions to the 10-year rule is if the IRA, IRA is inherited by um, the IRA's owner's minor child. Um, however, once that minor reaches adulthood, the 10-year rule uh, kicks in, which in most states you know, is at the age of 18. The last topic when discussing distributions is the potential use of a um, participant loan. Retirement plans may offer loans to participants, um, which allows you to borrow money you have saved up in your retirement account with the intent to pay yourself back. Uh, one of the major advantages of taking out a loan versus a distribution is um, not having to include the funds in your taxable income and therefore not having to pay taxes on it. And with that, we have our next polling question. Okay, thanks, Patty. Next polling question, what is the max credit amount for retirement savings contributions? Is it 100% of the contribution? Is it 50% of the contribution? Is it 20% of the contribution? Or is it 10% of the contribution? I'll give folks a few moments to respond to that. There, there have been a couple questions that have come in, Patty on the backdoor Roth. Uh, can you explain that um, a little further for folks on what exactly the backdoor Roth is? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, uh, sure. Um, like I stated, it's, you know, when you can take non-deductible, they can contribute to a, um, I'm sorry they convert a non-deductible traditional contributions um, into a Roth. Um, different yep. instances, I'm sorry, different instances, you know, obviously for every tax situation. So it would, you know, probably be best to reach out to your advisor and see if it would be beneficial for your particular tax situation. Okay, great, thanks, Patty. Let's look at those poll results now. Um, 43% say it's 50% of the contributions, 27% say 100% of the contributions, another 20% say 20% of the contributions. Um, Patty, can you clarify that for folks? Um, yeah, it's the 50% uh, is the maximum credit um, amount allowed. Okay, great, thanks. Now I will... Um, I guess pass it back to you, Patty, who uh, will cover education expenses. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> uh, next, I will discuss tax planning strategies um, that will help with education expenses um, and the funding vehicles that are available to hopefully achieve maximum tax savings. Um, we'll discuss different types of funding mechanisms. Uh, tax credits available for education expenses, as well as strategies that can be used um, for certain education accounts. Uh, 
Um, in addition to utilizing all the available funding vehicles, um, taxpayers should also look into the tax gifting rules and where they can benefit by maximizing their annual uh, gift exclusion. These uh, gifting amounts will be discussed later or more later in our webinar. And finally, when planning to use um, education accounts and or education tax credits, um, one still needs to consider uh, any financial aid consequences of these tax planning strategies. So let's kick it off with the different um, education funding mechanisms and each of their differences. One way to save for college is through an education savings account or an ESA. Uh, money deposited into an ESA grows tax-free. Um, there's no tax on distributions used for qualified college expenses. However, there are limits on who can contribute to an ESA, how much can be deposited each year, how long you can contribute to an ESA, and how long um, you can leave money in the ESA. Total contributions uh, for each child in any year cannot be more than $2,000 plus parents or others might not be allowed to contribute the full 2,000 each year if their AGI is between 95,000 and 110,000 for single filers or between 190,000 and 220,000 for joint filers. Uh, then the 2,000 limit for each child is gradually reduced to zero for that person. Contributions to a child's ESA um, aren't allowed after the child turns 18 and any money in an ESA must be also be distributed within 30 days after the child turns 30. Uh, next is the qualified tuition plan or better known to most of us as a 529 plan. Uh, one of the best ways for a parent to save for a child's college education is through a 529 plan. This plan um, can be set up at or before birth and funded until he or she goes to college, uh, which allows the funds to grow tax-free for years. Uh, in addition, grandparents and others can set up 529 accounts for the child as well. Uh, there's no tax on withdrawals used for qualified college expenses, uh, such as tuition, fees, uh, room and board, books, or computers. Um, money from a 529 plan can also be used to cover eligible expenses at a private elementary or a secondary school. You can use up to 10,000 uh, per year in a 529 plan to cover tuition only. Uh, for K through 12 education. Also, uh, many states offer tax breaks for residents who put money into a 529 plan sponsored by the state. Uh, for example, you might get a tax, uh, state tax deduction for contributions to the plan. The last funding mechanism to discuss is the use of withdrawals from an IRA uh, to fund education expenses. Of course, uh, since it's an IRA, it's meant to be used in retirement. Um, so you generally have to pay the 10% early withdrawal if you take money out before 59 and a half. However, you can withdraw funds from an IRA to pay for um, higher education expenses without the penalty. Uh, the education expenses must be for the taxpayer, the spouse, stepchildren, or grandchildren. <clears throat> Allowable expenses include tuition, fees, books, supplies, and equipment required for enrollment. Uh, for students attending on at least a half-time basis, uh, room and board are qualified expenses also. Uh, this, you know, is just a slide that shows the differences um, for looking back in the future for planning. And the next slide uh, illustrates the different strategies to consider with dealing with education accounts. Um, some of those strategies are rollovers are allowed with both ESAs and 529 plans. Um, Tax-free tax -free rollovers are allowed for the same beneficiary or for certain family members, such as a spouse, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and you know, certain others. Second uh, is changing the beneficiary. There are multiple reasons to change the beneficiary on an education account. For example, there may be leftover funds in a 529 plan um, that could be used by a different family member. Could transfer to a sibling if not used by the original intended child. Taxpayers uh, could have started the plan prior to birth of the child and now need to change the beneficiary to the child once the social security number was obtained. Um, and lastly, taxpayers may want the flexibility of being able to change investments um, more than twice a year. 
The third point uh, is with regards to losses in a 529 plan. Uh, taxpayers are able to take the loss on their tax returns when all amounts from the account have been distributed. Um, and then the total distributions are less than the basis um, that was contributed. The last strategy uh, with dealing with education accounts, and one of is one of importance, is the proper allocation of a qualified education expenses uh, when dealing with multiple education accounts, tax education credits, and any scholarship or other assistance. Uh, when dealing with multiple education benefits, the taxpayer needs to be sure that the same qualified expenses are not being used more than once. Next slide. Uh, on this slide, we discussed um, two available education, education tax credits. Uh, the first one is the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Um, this credit is available to people who are currently taking college courses. However, it's only available for expenses um, incurred by students who are in the first four years of undergraduate uh, study and who attend at least half-time basis. <clears throat> in addition, you must also be pursuing a program leading to a degree or uh, recognized education credential. A parent, spouse, or student um, who isn't cl claimed as a dependent can claim the credit for 100% of the first 2,000 spent on qualified education expenses and 25% of the next 2,000 for a total credit of 2,500 for each qualifying student. If the credit amount exceeds uh, the tax owed for the year, then the taxpayer will get a refund for 40% of the remaining, up to $1,000 for each qualifying child. The second tax credit uh, for people currently enrolled in college is the lifeline, Lifetime Learning Credit. With this credit, you can claim 20% of the first 10,000 of out-of-pocket costs uh, for college tuition, fees, and books for a total maximum credit of $2,000. Um, unlike the American Opportunity Credit, the Lifetime Learning Credit is not limited to undergrad undergraduate educational expenses, nor does the credit apply to only to students attending at least half-time. There's also no limit on the number of years the Lifetime Learning Credit can be claimed for each student. Um, that makes this credit perfect for older people going back to school to get a new job or to earn a second degree. Um, you can claim the credit for yourself, your spouse, or your dependent for up to 2000 uh, per family each year. Generally, the same types of expenses that qualify um, for both the American Opportunity Credit, also um, for the Lifetime Learning Credit. However, you can also claim the Lifetime Learning expenses uh, for classes taking, taken to acquire or improve job skills. Unfortunately, the Lifetime Learning Credit is not refundable. As a result, um, it can only reduce your tax to zero but the excess won't be refunded um, to you if the credit is more than your tax. Um, for, 20, for 2022, both higher education credits are phased out if your um, AGI is between 80,000 and 90,000 for single filers or 160,000 and 180,000 for married file and joint. Um, numerous rules and restrictions applies for these higher education credits, but if you're eligible um, for either credit, taxpayers, um, should consider prepaying college tuition bills that aren't due until early 23 um, if it would result in a bigger credit for this year. Uh, specifically, you can claim a 22 credit based on prepaying tuition um, for academic periods that begin in January through March of next year. Um, uh, last but certainly not least, um, when looking at the best options to maximize your tax savings, um, some taxpayers may want to look at the possibility of forego foregoing the dependency exemption um, to allow that child to claim the credit themselves uh, due to income thresholds for these credits. If the taxpayer exceeds the income threshold, the child could still be eligible uh, for the credit as long as they are not claimed as a dependent on your return. As discussed previously, these credits could be up um, to a maximum savings of $2,500. Uh, in order to capitalize on these savings, the taxpayer may need to shift assets uh, to the child in order to generate a tax liability to be used against the credits allowed. And with that, Chris, I think we have our final polling question, or I'm sorry, the next polling question. 
Yeah, <clears throat> it's actually both. It is the next and the final polling question. What is the max American Opportunity Tax Credit allowed per year? Is it 2,000 per student, 2,000 per taxpayer or per return? Is it 2,500 per student or 2,500 per return? Uh, we are running um, over a little bit, um, so I, you know, I apologize for that. Um, we're going to wrap up here shortly um, with our gift tax considerations. Um, we're, we're getting some great questions in. We don't have time to respond to all the questions. So I would encourage you to go to that chat function. We've got a link to your uh, CRICPA contact list. Um, please go ahead and uh, save that link uh, so you can go to um, the CRI webpage and find your local CRI professional who would be uh, happy to answer any other follow-up questions you may have. With that, let's look at the poll results. 54% um, say 2,500 per student, 25% say 2,000 per student. Um, Patty, can you clarify that for folks? Uh, the correct answer is C, it's uh, 2,500 per qualified student. Great, thanks. Now I'll pass it off to Richard to wrap up with uh, gift, gift tax considerations. Thank you, Chris. All right, so, so what is a gift? A gift is any transfer to an individual, either directly or indirectly, uh, where full consideration measured by money or money's worth is not received in return. Um, there are certain things that can be excluded, um, gifts that are not more than the annual exclusion for the calendar year, tuition or medical expenses that you pay for someone, uh, gifts to your spouse and gifts to a political organization for its use. Uh, it's also worth noting that political donations are not includable with your itemized deductions as a charitable donation. Um, the annual exclusion per donee is 16,000 for tax year 2022 and increased to 17,000 for tax year 2023. Uh, each donor has a lifetime exclusion, which is currently 12,060,000 000 for tax year 22 uh, and again increased uh, to 12 million nine hundred twenty thousand for tax year 2023. Uh, these these amounts are per donor so you can double them for married couples. Um, the current provision is to sunset at the end of 2025 and as of January 1st of 2026 the exemption is expected to be in the mid to high six million dollar range. An estate planning technique is, is the use of a Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, also known as a SLAP. This is an irrevocable trust created by one spouse for the benefit of the other. Uh, the donor spouse uses their gift tax exemption to make a gift to the SLAP, and the beneficiary spouse is named as, a, as the current beneficiary. These are being used to take advantage of the current lifetime exclusion amount before the anticipated decrease in tax year 2026. Uh, and Chris, with that, uh, I believe we are wrapped up. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. Um, on behalf of Richard and Patty and myself, um, we appreciate your time today. Um, here you have our contact information, um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, please go to the CRI CPA website if you're looking for a local um, tax professional who can also assist with your needs. I uh, also encourage you to connect with CRI uh, in our various uh, social media platforms. Um, that way you can get um, up, up to the minute um, tax updates and announcements um, directly to your social media feed. So with that, I will uh, wrap things up here and again, appreciate everyone's time today.